Dino
Okay. This is the case of the people of the state of Michigan versus Virgil Smith. Case number 15-005228-01-FH. Appearances, please. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Lisa Lindsay on behalf of the people of the state of Michigan. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Dr. Dillard appearing on behalf of the defense. Good morning to both of you, and good morning, Mr. Smith. Okay. Um, are we ready to proceed? Yeah. Yes. All right. And I received uh, both motions uh, from the people and the defendant's response. And so um, I'm ready to listen to your arguments. Your Honor, uh, I'm going to stand on my brief as to both uh, issues, the motion to vacate the plea as well as the motion to modify the terms and conditions of probation. I've stated my position in the brief, and uh, I think there's really nothing else to say. Um, we, uh, in fact, understand the court's position. The court cannot enforce that provision. Uh, and we respect the court saying that, but our position is if the court could not go along with it, then you should get, allow us the opportunity to withdraw the plea because that is not what we bargained for. Um, so, so instead you're asking me to enter an order vacating the plea? Correct. What is the distinction between asking the court to enter that sort of order under these facts uh, with the portion of the plea agreement that I've... Uh, um, said was void, and the distinction between that and simply asking me to enter that as a, um, a part of the judgment of sentence. You're still asking me uh, as the court uh, to participate um, in um, essentially attempting to get the defendant to resign as a state senator. No, we're not. What we're, what we're asking the court to do is allow us to find other conditions that would satisfy us in return for the reducing of the charge and things of that nature. That was one of the things that we considered in making our offer. We would like the opportunity to retool the offer without that provision. There could be some other things that we would require uh, absent that. The court, uh, so we're not saying enforce that provision. We're saying we didn't get the benefit of that, of, of that specific bargain maybe we could renegotiate something else in place instead of that. Instead of, instead of... Um, his resignation. So the point is, that is what we bargained for. The court could not uphold that bargain. I understand the court's position on that. But, but be that as it may, we should have an opportunity to retool our offer in that situation. Okay. Thank you. Um, and uh, good afternoon, Mr. Evelyn. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Would you like to put your appearance on the record? For the record, Jeremy, on behalf of the defendant, had to drop my son off at the airport. That's quite all right. All right, all right. Uh, Mr. Dillard or Mr. Evelyn? Uh. Uh, well, Judge, l let me just first address the last portion of the so-called retooling. Um, as I cited in my brief, I think that would be highly prejudicial uh, to the defendant at this particular time. Uh, given the fact that, you know, he has uh, pled guilty, uh, you know, and the like. Um, I just don't think we can go back to uh, a status quo ante. And I think even the case that they cited uh, made it clear that, that that's not the proper way to resolve it. Um, um, and I, I really don't know what other conditions that they could offer us uh, uh, to make this work, I, I, I guess you know, Judge. This is a this is an important question. As I pointed out in our brief, I don't think this has ever come up before. Uh, it goes back to uh, you know James Madison's uh, uh, founding father, the father of the Constitution, a lawyer. Uh, talked about the separation of powers, the checks and balance system. And uh, he made the point that ambition must, must counteract ambition. And what did, what did he mean by that? The real question is, does the prosecutor have the authority and the power to remove a person from office? That's simply what, what we're talking about here. Uh, uh, we think that that power, when we talk about whether or not someone should sit in a legislative seat, resides one with the legislature and legislature, and two with the uh, 
citizenry of the senator's district. And uh, as uh, our founding fathers talked about checks and balances, the concern about here is one branch of government exceeding the authority uh, as against the other branches of government. And that's exactly what, what we got here. I also want to say that Senator Smith's desire not to resign is not uh, out of any kind of uh, vanity or snubbing his nose at anyone. Uh, I think it, it comes from a desire that out of this tragedy that he found himself in, uh, that his legacy uh, uh, tarnished by the press as some kind of lurid tryst, tryst and the like, I think really once he, this gives him an opportunity to, to stand on some principle, on a very important principle, and to test a very important principle, a constitutional principle, not only of the United, not only of Michigan but the entire United States, that can uh, the executive branch exceed its authority? Can a prosecutor become the legislature? Can a prosecutor become uh, the citizen and recall just by making this offer? And uh, I, I don't think I don't think the prosecutor has that authority. I don't think the prosecutor has that authority. So if there's anything that Senator Smith can get out of this event, is to stand on a principle that as we go forward, as Michigan goes forward, as the prosecutor goes forward, and if we encounter a situation similar to like this in the future, where we have a legislator involved in something, this might be a situation where he, his principle of standing today and not resigning can block that power. In other words, ambition can be on, counteracted by ambition, that another branch of government can come in and say, you've gone too far. And I think that's what the court has said here. You've gone too far, Madam Prosecutor. You've gone too far. But I don't think we can go back to uh, status quo ante. I don't think we can go backwards now, as they're suggesting, as vacate the plea and then force us back into a situation where we have to re renegotiate the entire plea, I think the court has done the right thing. The court had made a judgment. It has sentenced the defendant to 10 months. The cases cited by the prosecution are clearly distinguishable. They have nothing to do with constitutional principles. They're only talking about a, car a contractual interpretation. Your decision is a principle one. It, it does not sub, uh, subvert the ends of justice. It's not an abuse of discretion. You're, this court is doing what the court is supposed to do. Make a determination whether or not the executive branch has exceeded its authority. The Siebert case just doesn't apply. This is not a sentence that's less than the term agreed upon between us. The agreed upon term was 10 months. The court has sentenced him to 10 months in the county jail. It's not the Siebert case. It's not the Siebert case. The Siebert case does not apply. And so I'm asking the court to not vacate the agreement. I, I'm asking the court to let it stand, allow the senator to stand on principle, Stand against what we view is excessive power by the prosecutor, and let if they decide to appeal, let the court of appeals, the Supreme Court, decide who's right and who's wrong. You know, I, I, when I was thinking about this case, just I often said, you know, it's often in criminal cases where liberty is at stake that we have these constitutional issues that come up. And it's often in these kind of cases, the public, the press, there's a certain amount of appropriate, you know, disgust or censor about the person. Why don't he do this? Why don't he just resign? And often in those moments, people stand on principle. And often, many, many times, their principles are upheld. And then, in, and then when people look back, oh, he stood on principle and it was the right principle, we're all happy and that was good law. But during the moment, during the moment of the challenge, you know, there's disgust, there's a program, there's censure, and that's what he's getting now. So I'm asking the court to allow him to stand on principle, allow him to, 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 to go forward with some sense of dignity, 
in this tragic situation that he found himself, a young senator with a promising career, and not and not come away with anything. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. Judge, please, by way of brief rebuttal, I, 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 I have to say this. In a courtroom, I have to say, counsel is being somewhat disingenuous with all his talk about principles, but if I was on the street, I'd say counsel was talking out of both sides of his neck because counsel repeatedly indicated that this is what he wanted to do. He, the way he sits here and talks like he wasn't even a part of the bargaining process, he sat in an office with Mr. Evelyn, myself, and Prosecutor Worthy, and we discussed these terms. He did not at that time say anything about my client wants to stand on his constitutional principles, but what happened is when he found out how the court was leaning, now he's going to come up in here and flatter the court with, oh, the court has made the very righteous and the most important decisions, and I think these judge. Let's call it what it is. He is taking advantage now of what the court has done to say he wanted to do that all along. As a matter of fact, when we were just sitting in the witness room discussing, he said to me in the witness room, I wish my client would just go ahead and resign because it would make everything easier. And he said it was a problem that was created by the court. That's what he said in the witness room. But he's going to come in here in court in front of all these cameras and flatter the judge. All we're asking for, judge, if the court cannot follow the terms of our agreement, and I understand the court's reasoning on that, what we need to do is go back and try to retool the offer that we made because that is only fair because fairness goes both ways. You can't have it both ways. Fairness goes both ways. We took months and months and months to come to a bargain that we thought everybody could live to. I thought, and maybe I was wrong, I thought and prosecuting words thought that, that Mr. Dillard was a man of his word and we thought that Virgil Smith was a man of his word when they said they were going to do those things. Obviously we were wrong. Judge, let me, I have to respond. Judge, I'm not on trial. I have not been charged with anything. Okay, now she's making ad hominem remarks toward me. It's not ad hominem. Just as I said, I don't think we can go back to a status quo ante at this particular situation. I think that that's unfair to the defendant uh, to, to then force him to go back and renegotiate this deal. I think the deal. Is, is, is the deal that we agreed to. This court has made, at least preliminarily, made the determination that this court felt that it could not do that. It entered a judgment to that effect. As I said, there's going to be a lot of program, a lot of name calling, a lot of that going on on this particular case. And what I'm saying is that it's a legitimate issue, and it's a legitimate issue that this court has felt it's a legitimate issue. It should be a legitimate issue. If they think it's a legitimate issue and our position is legitimate, let the Court of Appeals or a higher court make the decision who's right and who's wrong. If it was so legitimate, Judge, why did he agree to it? Well, let, let me ask a couple of questions. Well, I, I guess I could say um, the same thing to the prosecutor because uh, my guess is just no one ever thought uh, that uh, making it part of a plea agreement would be a problem. I mean, it didn't occur to me on the date that uh, Mr. Smith pled guilty. It wasn't until some weeks later, uh, after thinking about it, that it finally occurred to me that this must be a problem. So I simply assume uh, that when the parties uh, entered into this negotiation and made this part of the plea agreement, they simply, it simply didn't occur to them. Uh, as I said before, I don't really think there was any uh, ill will um, or ill intention uh, on the part of uh, either party in terms of uh, making this part of the plea agreement. But, um, Ms. Lindsay, if I grant your motion and vacate the plea, it allows the prosecutor uh, to go back to square one and go forward with the case to trial against, the pro against Mr. Smith with any of the original charges and with any charge that they could have brought at that particular time. 
Is that correct? Any of the original charges, I don't believe we can add charges. Okay. But, um, um, so that would mean that Mr. Smith would face uh, prosecution for the uh, malicious destruction of personal property, the 10-year uh, felony, felonious assault, the four-year felony, felony firearm, the two-year felony, and um, domestic violence, the 93-day misdemeanor. Uh, obviously, the most, or at least in my mind, um, the harshest one of those is the felony firearm um, because it carries a mand mandatory two years in prison if he's convicted of that crime, uh, which would have to be served consecutively with and preceding any term of imprisonment if I imposed a term of imprisonment for count one or count two. Is that correct? Correct. So that's a very big difference between uh, what he pled to here, where he pled to five years of probation uh, with the first 10 months or 10 months in the Wayne County Jail. Is that correct? That is very really correct. Okay. And um, that a defendant would want to avoid a prison term, this felony firearm sentence, uh, in exchange for a jail sentence is uh, not uncommon, is it? Are you asking me the answer to answer questions that you already know the answer to? Okay, well, uh, uh, I guess the answer is yes, I am ask asking you to answer questions that I may know the answer to. Well, if you know the answer to them, I don't think I need to answer oh, it. Okay, all right, very well. Okay. Um, and um, paragraph 10 of uh, Mr. Smith's response uh, made reference to, I can't remember right now if it was the Siebert or the Martinez case. Okay. And uh, you cite a portion of that particular case. And the way I interpret the portion that you cited is that what you're saying to this court without using those explicit terms. You're saying, you've said in your response, Judge, we don't think you should vacate the plea, but if you decide you're going to, please give us an opportunity to uh, resign so that I can avoid the two years, of an, almost un an almost certain prison sentence, and instead do the 10 months in the jail. Would that be a fair interpretation? That is correct, because I think that's what the Seabird case said. And that I find a real demonstration of the um, coercive power um, that's innate in allowing um, the executive branch, the prosecutor, to engage in these types of negotiations. All right, anything more people or the defense wishes to say? Nothing. Nothing further, Your Honor. Okay, I need a few minutes, okay? All right. Thank you.